Chapter 10. Long Bridges At Tratinus, you have a terrible habit of letting the cold air in, General Silius complained. You and your dog can enter without inducing a chill in an old man, surely. Marcus hurried into the general's room. My apologies, sir, he said, and signaled for me to sit. You summoned me? The general nodded. His lip curled slightly. I'd have told you by now if I hadn't. Sir, is that all you can say? Silius demanded. He was almost as hard to read as Marcus. I wasn't sure if that was humour or exasperation in his tone. Sir? Marcus repeated. I see the campaigning has not delivered you a sense of humour, De Curio. Silius looked suspicious. Unless that was meant to be a joke. I'm not one to laugh at my commanders, sir, Marcus replied. You might find it to your benefit to laugh with them from time to time, though. Silius grinned. Sir? The general rolled his eyes and picked up a wax tablet. After a moment of exaggerated study, he nodded and looked up. Right, um, yes, it's a matter of logistics, you see. Logistics, sir? Officially, the boys you came in with are going back north and getting home by boat. But space is at a premium. Your hound is just so much extra baggage, and the enmity between you and Commander Drustanus doesn't seem to have abated, so that makes matters even more difficult. Marcus's face betrayed annoyance. Commander Drustanus, sir? The general looked slightly pained. There's no honey coating it for you, Atratinus. Men advance fastest in war. Did you imagine you would be the only one climbing the ranks? No, sir, I just... I hadn't heard. Don't suppose it will help your mood to learn that it was the gladiatorial rights that pushed it through. You both made a good showing, but he managed to get the crowd, so he gets the promotion. The general set the tablet down on his desk and moved over to the brazier. He extended his hand to the heat rising from the coals. Told you once before he had something you lacked in that department. I don't doubt you think you could have won that encounter if your sword hadn't snapped. But that's not what's important. What it boils down to is that most of the men wanted Dristanus to win. That's why they were so quick to declare the matter over as soon as your weapon broke. The general looked back to us and smiled. I remember you once told me that some dogs are meant to hunt. Take solace in that, and accept that not all of us have the same strengths. Dristanus holds command over a little more than a hundred men, but you will have a seat at the council table of the men commanding this whole army. I don't follow, Marcus said. The general nodded. That's because I'm getting ahead of myself. The problem is that we don't have enough boats. Nor can we afford to have any bad blood when the men must already contend with cramped and uncomfortable conditions. Recipe for disaster, I'm sure you'd agree. Marcus nodded stiffly and the general continued. When confronted with these issues, I ask myself what the point of wasting a good scout on a sea journey is. The 1st, 5th, 20th and 21st all have to go south over land. Where would you say your talents would be better deployed? Marcus stood straight. I am ready to serve in any capacity, sir. That looks to have cost you already. The general cast me a pitying glance. Your hound, at any rate. He looked back to the beeswax melting under his thumb. Don't take this temporary reassignment as any kind of censure. You would be serving me still. Have no fear that I would cast you aside so easily. I'll only be lending you to General Caesena for the duration of the journey. I'm gratified to hear that, sir, though I'm also ready to serve where I'm most needed. I should think so. Caesena is a fine man and a canny commander. It was his boys doing most of the scouting in the Teutoburg, and they had good things to say about you. Thank you, sir. The thing is that the way south is going to be difficult. It's harsh terrain and marshland for much of the way. Though where isn't in this pox-ridden country, eh? Still, I told Caesena I'd make you available to him. In fact, it's been agreed that you'll be attached to his staff. Bring some of that experience to bear. Sir, Marcus saluted. We're back to that again, are we? I hope you are more open with your views when you're on Caesena's staff. I don't want him to go saying that his new master of scouts is a mute. The general regarded Marcus for a second. Would it kill you to show pleasure at your own promotion, Atratinus? Apologies, sir. I hope I will be sufficient to the task, Marcus replied. You'd better be sufficient. This is no gift we're giving. The Pontus Longi is likely the best way south, but it won't take much for Armenius to guess where you're headed. If the legions don't get through quickly enough, it could spell disaster. It's your job to help Caesena avoid making mistakes in the swamps. Sir, that causeway is more than 15 years old. Can it even be relied upon? Marcus asked. The general let out a breath. You make a fair point, Atratinus, but speed was our ally in the early part of this campaign. We must hope it may yet serve us. Marcus hesitated for an instant, then said, That was when they didn't anticipate us. 
Now they have to know our movement, and they have had a whole season to swell their numbers with outraged tribesmen. You make the point well, Atratinus, the general replied. Your caution gratifies me. It tells me I'm sending the right man. Four legions marched behind us. I couldn't hear them yet, but the silence in the forest around us told me a story. The birds had stopped singing and the squirrels were in hiding. The unnatural stillness also extended in front of us, so I knew the legions were not alone in moving through the overgrown swamps. Our enemy was close. Marcus glanced at me, then turned to his second in command. We're not alone out here, Pulcher. Marcus's second was a lean man with salt and pepper hair. He had a constant squint gained from his first tour in more arid lands. He turned his narrow eyes on the dilapidated wooden roadway before us. The bridges look as though they wouldn't hold a single party, let alone four legions, and if they're this decayed at the start, there's every chance there will be trouble farther in. There's no going back now, Marcus mused. We have to reach our lines before it's too late. If we wait to retreat, things only get worse. The chief was right when he recommended speed. Perhaps we were being a bit optimistic to think we could outrun the tribesmen. A bit optimistic? Numerius Pulcher asked, raising one of his heavy eyebrows. My master shrugged. You can look at it another way if you like. We always knew this was a likely outcome. But our lads have the grit to pull through if they stay tight and don't give in to panic. Pulcher nodded grimly. We've certainly kicked them from one end of this interminable forest to the other. I hope you're right. Neither man mentioned the spectre of the bones piled deep in the Teutoburg. We'll do it if each man does his duty, Marcus said resolutely before turning his horse. And, of course, if that rotten causeway doesn't just dump us straight into a bog. He spurred his mount on and I was forced to dash off the riders. I wish I could give you better news, sir, but there's little doubt in my mind that the enemy will be waiting for us. And that this cursed swamp will be near impassable, General Kaesina supplied. Afraid I am forced to concur with your assessment, sir. Marcus took a look at Kaesina's sour face and added, with regret. Ah, what have you to regret? A scout doesn't lay the land, he just reports on it. The general blew out a long breath and shook his head ruefully. It was optimistic to assume that we would be able to move fast enough to escape harassment. All that remains to us now is to bloody them bad enough that they will have to let us pass. Kaesina glared into the shadowed corners of the tent. We'll see how far we get in the morning. Dismissed. Marcus saluted and left the tent without another word. The bridges stretched off to the west between low hills, but they were in poor repair and gave out almost as soon as the first units crossed them. Even those that held were perilous for the heavy baggage train that lurched along at the centre of our column. The better part of two decades flooding had done their work. Kaesina ordered details to start the reconstruction of the damaged way, but almost as soon as work began the tribesmen descended from the trees around us. Harsh cries broke the air and javelins and arrows rained down upon us. Many heads turned to the marching camp behind us. It was clear that more than one man would rather retreat than face the enemy coming from the hills. Marcus cursed and rode to Kaesina's side. We must keep moving. If we start to retreat, they'll cut us down in this mud. The general nodded. We must not break. He called out to his officers. Protect the men repairing the road. Tell them to hold fast. And work fast. The sooner we have a way forwards, the better our chances of seeing the other side of the Rhine again. Shouts rose through the ranks, and squads hurried to carry out Kaesina's hasty orders. The legionaries fought as best they could, but the larger tribesmen had a distinct advantage in the mud and water that prevented them getting into range. Legionary armour didn't help, given the slippery footing and the way the mud sucked at men's feet. The German heavy spears did terrible business that first day. With no way to retreat, the army was forced to press forward. Some were given the task of repairing the way ahead while others had to hold off the assaults. The horses were able to move through the terrain a bit better than men, but not well enough, and from the start the Germans made riders their special target. Kaesina and his staff fell back behind the battle lines and reviewed their options. I stood witness to this meeting, already as sodden and covered with mud as I had ever been as a pup. We must have dry ground if we are to repel them, one of the staffers said. What's our best chance? The general looked to Marcus. I'd advise making for the plain over there. Marcus pointed ahead and the other riders craned to see the small stretch of relatively solid ground. It will at least allow us to set up fortifications and get out of this swamp. Kaesina squinted, weighing the option. It looks workable. He turned to one of his staff. Have the bridge builders make for that point. The man hurried to obey. The fight raged through the afternoon. We pushed forward by inches, clearing a path through our enemies. 
The wooden walkway extended slowly behind its screen of flesh and Roman arms, the engineers screaming as fervently as those who died ahead of them. Exhaustion took its toll, and I could read the tension in those around me. My master watched the fighting from his horse, snarling at every man lost. I could tell he wanted to charge in more than once, but there was little that one man could do. It's often easier to be in the front lines than have to watch and wait, isn't it, Atratinus? Caesina commented. A charge might drive them off for a bit, sir, Marcus replied to his commander. True, but the bridge works are fragile enough without sending horses plunging in there. Besides, we're as likely to lose mounts we can't afford to be without as make any real impact. A cavalry charge loses much of its effectiveness when you get strung out in a swamp. Marcus slumped slightly, accepting the truth of the general's words. They may not hold out long enough for the works to reach the drier ground, he observed. Caesina nodded. You voice my own fear. The general looked over to the horizon where the sun was beginning to sink. At this moment our hope is that darkness stops the fighting and gives us a chance to regroup. The legions held that last hour like a drowning man clutching to a spar. Prayers to Mars were made in whispers or screams, and more than one wife or lover's name was lost in bubbles beneath the cloudy waters. When it became too dark to keep fighting, the tribesmen melted back into the hills, leaving us to recover as best we could and prepare for the next day. There would be little chance for rest, however. The guttural songs of our enemies echoed down to us from the hills, a joyous celebration of a victory all but claimed. There was worse to come that night, for the tribesmen were not idle. When the night was at its darkest, there was a terrible rushing sound and timbers cracked like old bones out in the swamp. I woke from a light sleep, barking. Soon enough, cries of consternation joined my shouts. Armenius has diverted the river, men shouted. Some campfires set at the edge of the swamp hissed and winked out as the water rose. Men poured from their bedrolls as the water found them, but that was not the worst damage. The flooding had washed away the work of the afternoon. Caesina took the setback with grim determination, and we began again. Men scrabbled through the mud to find what spars remained, while others locked shields and tried to hold back a tide far darker than the churning streams that still ran through the marshes. It took a whole day under fire for the bridge across the marsh to be ready. The legions paid dearly for every repeated step, and we were simply too exhausted to advance before the next morning. The Germans spent another night singing and mocking us from the hills. If they felt any fatigue, it seemed to be chased away by the prospect of our destruction. The legions were not so lucky. It was foreboding that robbed us of sleep. More than one man spent his night about the fitful fires, talking odds with his brothers. And by morning, there were rumours that even Caesina had suffered in Morpheus's realm. Whispers about the camp told how Varus had risen from the marshes and beckoned the commander deeper into the swamp, causing him to wake with a cry and drenched in a fearful sweat. When the march began again the next morning, every man understood the stakes. We must make it through that day or die. The column assembled with the baggage train in the middle of four legions. The 5th and 21st would protect the flanks, and the 1st would lead the advance. The 20th would be the rear of the column, and the cavalry would ride just behind the baggage. It was a common enough marching formation, but the general and his staff had thrashed out the order into the small hours of the morning, reminding all officers that the formation would have to stay together if there was to be any chance of reaching safety. The discipline of fearful men is a thin thread at which to grasp. Juno's tits, they're breaking, Marcus called out. The Germans had hit us just as soon as we passed the point of no return. Worse like no sooner had the 20th braced for their first assault than the timbers beneath the wagons began to creak. We pressed on, but it hadn't been long before the bridge failed, and the baggage became stuck in the mud. Marcus sat his horse, split between the need to fight and the need to help with the righting of the wagons and carts. His decision was made for him by the men of the 5th Legion, who were making for dry land instead of standing to help protect the baggage. The enemy was quick to see the weakness and a new charge began aimed straight at the centre of our column and the stranded baggage. Caesina called out and the cavalry poured into the growing breach. I was nearly up to my chest in water, snarling and biting as best I could. Hooves fell about me and spears lunged upwards. I would surely have died there had the tribes not been focused on killing as many horses as possible. The German fighters had no time to look down before I sank my teeth into a calf or thigh. My master's blade would finish off the man I'd bitten before he could register that he needed to focus on two opponents. I was not the only hound let loose into that melee, but I was the only one trained to stay close to a rider when fighting. Some of my brethren had been strapped into spiked harnesses, but whether that did more than slow them down, I don't know. Men with spears do not need to fear spikes. More than once I heard a yelp or a squeal as the camp dogs died. 
The words a dying man spat out meant little to me, but the pitiful deaths of other hounds tugged at the primal fear that had followed me since we piled the bones in the forest. I could see the wings flapping in the darkness that made up half my world. Marcus's horse went down, adding its own animal cries to the cacophony of battle. He threw himself clear and came up, dripping with gore and mud. My bad eye prevented me from registering what had happened until the last second. I threw myself away from the falling horse and the wave of its impact sent me rolling through the shallow water. I came up spluttering and shouting, ready to vent my rage on anyone who dared come close. A spear plunged towards me. I charged in under the descending point, throwing myself from the clinging mud and locking my jaws around my attacker's throat. The German fell back gurgling and I went with him, tearing as if I might hold back the howling things hovering above me with pure fury. Infantry rushed in behind me as cohorts from the 1st Legion ran to help protect the baggage. I kept tearing flesh, oblivious to anything else, until I felt a kick in my side. It was enough to sober me and I danced back between Roman legs, desperately searching for Marcus in the chaos. The fighting had borne him away as he struggled to keep up with Caesena. The general's own horse had been lost and Marcus had joined a group of 1st Legion soldiers as they rushed to his aid. Despite his age, the general gave a good account of himself. He shook off the effects of his fall and regained his feet on his own. Then he rejoined the fray, hacking until his forearm was stained to the elbow. The clash was a bitter one, for it was clear the tribesmen knew how valuable the general was. Only the men protecting the eagle saw such slaughter as we did, as the Germans tried to extinguish our fighting spirit. The German charge had split the column, and the struggle became about holding our units together while the men of the 20th tried to make it to the 1st. The cavalry had not fared well in the fighting, and riderless horses punched holes in the already fraying lines. We'll not hold much longer, Marcus yelled to the general as they gave ground. Marcus no longer needed to tell me to hold back. I was panting deeply and the taste of blood had become cloying. Another wave of men crashed against us. We barely held. Marcus was bleeding freely from a wound on his shield arm and the general's face was grey. He had fought like a younger man before, but the strength was gone now. He cast his heavy eyes over our flagging line. The baggage, he murmured. Sir! Marcus hacked the head off an incoming spear and dispatched its owner with a backhanded swipe. The general ignored him and turned to one of his other staff members. They're going for the baggage train. More and more of our attackers were becoming distracted by the temptation of the goods carried in the carts. The wounded left defenseless in the wagons were quickly dispatched, and the tribesmen got down to squabbling over the spoils. This distraction blunted the German assault and gave us time to withdraw. Give the signal to fall back now, Caesena bellowed to one of his subordinates. Moments later, trumpets sounded. At their general's orders, the men of the 1st and 20th legions abandoned their defense, withdrawing in cohorts and leaving the tribesmen to loot their prize. If the Germans had pressed their attack, the armies of the Lower Rhine would have fallen then. Fortunately, their greed got the better of them, and the beleaguered legions reached the relative safety of the plain, where the 5th and 25th were already setting up fortification. We lived to see another sunset, but we had lost all our supplies. What little food we still had was bitter with slime and blood. We took shelter behind hastily constructed wooden walls and waited for the end.